Hey, welcome everybody to DEF CON 1 Science, our fourth one. Now, I know we were supposed to do this every week. However, due to logistics, we're going to probably be doing it every other week. But we have a show to make up for the fact we weren't on for last Sunday or two. So today we're going to be discussing if the question is there, what happened before the Big Bang, a sensical question to ask. And we have a great lineup with you with us today. We have, of course, with us Landon Kurt Knoll, my co-host. Welcome back, hello, Landon. Hello, hello. We've got Thank Dr. You, back. Good Dr. morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on the time zone. Mm. Mm. And, 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 and again, time zones good, are because the Earth isn't flat, right? <laughs> yes. Also, a special thing there is that I've, I'm taking the YouTube feed and seeing it, feeding it through the satellite. Um, so the folks at Adios and Scott are in a party, Sunrise Party, and uh, hello to those folks. Uh, there. Well, hi. So uh, if you That's great. so hi to the South Pole. And by the way, people remember, uh, Landon actually called me from a Iridium sat phone from the South Pole, so it, it does exist. But uh, we also got Dr. John Kroon with us. You guys remember him from his Proto Planet discussion on the Non Sequitur show, show. He's going to be doing another one, I think, next week, but uh, he's with us today to talk about this particular topic. Welcome, Dr. Kroon. Thank you for having me. And you might recognize Astro Athens on the very left on my screen here. She is. <laughs> An international model and an amateur astronomer, and she has a great channel. I've I've recently just been exposed to her on Twitter and on YouTube, and I've been kind of binge watching. And one of the videos that I came across was on the no boundary proposal, and I thought she did such a stellar job on it. I was like, let's get her on and actually let's talk about that particular topic um, in this video. But I'm gonna. Uh, the link to, to her video channel is in the video description. So be before you even introduce her and before she even says anything, go subscribe to her first. We got to get her at least a couple hundred subs out of this. So anyways, uh, yes. Athena, <laughs> well welcome to our channel. Woo, thank you so much. Happy to be here. Woo! Very excited to talk about some stuff. <laughs> yes, coffee. And what is that in the background? What did you got there on the, on the oh, painting? Falcon Heavy. Falcon, Falcon Heavy. heavy. It's really a yeah, uh, great photo, actually. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Taken by Ryan, also known as Space Tripper, or uh, Science Tripper, actually, on, a, on, on, a, huh. on Instagram. But yeah, he took that himself. It's really cool. Yeah, the, first, old... I, the first time I ever saw one of the Falcon 9s, I, I honestly thought it was a CGI. I really did. I'm not going to lie. I, I was like, this is this can't be real. Yeah. Um, but that's it looks like just it. the... It's the so good. It's amazing the technology, isn't it? I mean, we've just come so far in our advancement and understanding of, of rocketry that have something like that that can actually go vertical and come back vertical. And who would have thunk, right? Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Yeah, exactly. That could be a nice giant poster in my bedroom. <laughs> so we that's are waiting great. for Kyle. Unfortunately, Kyle hasn't showed up yet, but we didn't know where we're going to start. We are, we are dual streaming. This is a first for us. We're actually streaming to my channel and in the Non Sequitur channel. So. Hopefully, you can join us from either one of them. Um, Welcome, dive into on, depending on which, which channel you're on. Yes. 
Welcome yeah, to Witch one, Queen. One. Yes, Dave. What's back? Okay. Oh. Okay, that, that explains oh, yeah. why you can't join us. Hopefully he's okay. Okay. Uh, well, it's a problem that the electrons of his car were excessively repelling the electrons of the other car. And mm -hmm. Due to the quality of screws in principle, they could not be at the same, same, same time. And so things went <laughs> what, what did I tell you about Landon overthinking <laughs> prior to the show? <laughs> That's why we love it. Because he knows what Pauly's exclusion principle is. Okay, so anyways, we're going to dive right into this. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you guys the question first to kind of get you guys' opinion on it. I'm going to kind of go through a presentation that I made. Landon has changed a couple slides, so I'll defer to him on those slides. But I'm going to give my argument why I think that the question, uh, what happened before the Big Bang, is nonsensical. And unfortunately, Kyle can't join us to give his side because he thinks it is a sensible question. But we, we can't change the, the events that have happened. So, um, I think I'm going to start with you because you are the new person to the channel. Um, when I first got a hold of you and I asked you this question, um, you kind of gave me your, your opinion on it. But what, what do you think of the question? I mean, do you think that's a sensible question to ask? And if no, why not? Um, well, I actually do think it's it's pretty sensical to ask just because they're um, – the all of human history, we always want to try and ask why and what the reason is behind uh, – um, why certain things really go on and then what can actually back it up. So as far as what happened before the Big Bang, um, it's something that in all honesty needs to be figured out because there's so much debate about it right now. So um, as far as what actually went on bef before the Big Bang, um, th there's a big question mark right now over all of it. So um, I do think that it, it is something that uh, obviously needs to be pondered. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, Believe you, uh, you were actually going to give your your opinion first, but uh, I was going to actually branch off of of what you were going to say. But yeah, it's definitely uh, something that that uh, yeah, that there, there's a lot right okay. now that, that has to be said about. It. I'm ready to dive into. All right, so she <laughs> thinks think, that think it's, it's a natural. A yeah, I think it's a natural right. question to ask. It may not be a sensible question yeah. to answer, it's, but it's yeah. a natural. It's 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 a common sense question. Well, to, to, to ask. Okay, let's clarify. Let's clarify because there might be some kind of um, disparity in the in the question formation. Um, we do ask yeah. questions. People do ask questions all the time. But mm -hmm. there are such things as nonsensical questions. My example would be, where do you find I on the real number line? It's sure mm -hmm. you can ask that question, but it really makes mm -hmm. no sense to do what? so. I think that this I mean, is a similar question that makes no sense South to Pole? ask. Well, that's yeah. the, the, the example yeah. that Hawking uses, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. use that exact example. So I I don't think that is a sensible question to ask, even though we are allowed to ask certain questions. Um, but does it make sense to do so, Doctor Krim? What do you think? Yeah, I th I mean not to um, be a broken record, but I agree in the sense that it's not very, I guess, sensible. But we could learn a lot from it by asking it. We learn, you know, we ponder a lot of deep. Uh, deeply rooted aspects of uh, of the universe of time of space right now and uh, the moment of uh, the big bang and thinking about all of these things at a, a very uh, advanced level can be extremely uh, interesting to say the least so it's a worthwhile endeavor even if the answer is no nothing as we know it existed before um, the singularity of the big bang Okay, I think that's a fair way to put it. Um, yeah, I mean, we do have an inquisitive nature. We do want to know the answers of things, and we also want to know if it even makes sense to ask that kind of question. So um, do you guys want to just, like, jump into this presentation that I sent and then kind of go through each slide and give your evaluation of maybe the way Hawking takes his, his approach, the new no-boundary proposal, to say, okay, can we at least model the universe in a way to get us to t equals zero, which would be, as we know it, um, the singularity event, right? That would be the start of everything, if there's going to be a start of some kind. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think I think yeah. part of the thing that we have to come up with is what happened at t equals zero. If we can, mm -hmm. if we can determine that before you talk about is there a negative t and is, is the question relevant? Yeah, exactly. And the, the, the way that they go about it, it requires a very sophisticated means of uh, modeling using quantum mechanics, loop quantum gravity, and general relativity. And that's why I think that to even answer the question, certain things have to be kind of understood um, conceptually wise. It's not an easy question to ask, ask uh, or, or be answered even at time equals zero, 
which they're attempting to do. So what I kind of did with through this presentation, I just hit the high points of what I think that the average person would have to go learn about in order to try to understand what the no boundary proposal is and what it would take to model such a thing at t equals zero or hypothetically before t equals zero, which would be the question, you know, what happened before the Big Bang. Um, so how about we just kind of dive into that and then I'll be asking you three uh, about each slide and what you think and then we can kind of relate to the audience these kind of concepts. Sound good? Yeah, sure. let's do it. Excellent. Okay. All right, Dave, roll it. Roll it, roll it, roll it. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be a trigger warning just to get you guys um, you know, prepared for this. This is going to be some major science. This is not like our typical, um, we're just going to be talking about some kind of superficial stuff. When we talk about science in the DEF CON um, 1 show, we kind of at least want to make it such that we don't want to water down too much, but we do want to have the high points of the science, but we want to be able to explain it in a way that the audience understands it because you guys are not idiots. You guys have had some basic science. And I think that you guys can probably understand everything that we're gonna have in here, um, except for one or two things that even I don't understand. That's what Landon added. But uh, anyways, it is the, why the question, um, why the question of what happened for the Big Bang? Does it make sense? Okay, next slide. A little bit of an overview here. Um, I'm gonna be showing using a little bit of math and physics, why the question, what happened before the Big Bang is nonsensical. I'm gonna be taking what's called a heuristic approach, meaning an approach that uses uh, an ex analogies and examples may not be exactly true, but in a way to be a pedagogical approach to, to teaching uh, these concepts, because they are things that you're gonna have to take six months to a year to even kind of even begin to understand it. Um, even most of the things we're gonna talk about, I don't have a very deep understanding. It's a very superficial understanding. But this is not something that's gonna be um, something to get you through college physics, okay? Um, I do suck at quantum mechanics, I'm not gonna front. Uh, we didn't have to learn much quantum in nuke school. It was all just atomic physics. So most of what I learned about quantum, I had to do on my own, or I did take physics in college. But even then, they don't really get into the, the details of quantum mechanics unless you take an actual course in quantum mechanics. Course. I think most of the people I have here have a lot more education in this topic than I do. So, um, so I highly recommend well, what you, you at some at that? some point uh, the, the, at some point uh, the new school is going to include fusion reactors, and then they'll have to learn quantum mechanics. At so, at some point, um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, right now, I mean, everything in the new school is all fission, it's all pressurized water reactors, not even boiling. So we're not even at boiling water reactors yet. We, so, uh, but anyways, um, I recommend that you just take what you we, we put out here and check with actual experts, even though they are actual experts in here, but somebody who's maybe specifically uh, expertise in quantum mechanics and, well, cosmology, co cosmogony would be the, the correct term. Next <laughs> slide. I had way too much coffee this morning, so can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> um, what is and is not the Big Bang? The Big Bang is not a theory of origin of the universe. I think we all agree upon that, right? I mean, would you guys say that a lot of people get that conceptually confused, that they think the Big Bang is yeah. how the universe began? Yeah, absolutely. And why, why do they do that? Yeah. Why do they think that for some reason the Big Bang is the origin of the universe and not the, the, the theory that explains the rapid infla or the inflation of the universe after universe began why would why would you think people kind of make that mistake and inflate the two Tina? i think it probably has to do with the name itself because when you hear this terminology of big bang you initially think okay th that involves some type of force and it involves some type of matter so that means that that had to have what started everything that we know in existence today and then they don't Unless you actually break it down and look at the entire scale of going from like also the dark ages and then into inflation and then into when it, everything actually started to form and galaxies and stars formed, um, then you see, oh, wait a second, this isn't actually like uh, uh, what, like you said, is, isn't really actually the origin of the universe. Um, it, it's, it, it's more of a, just an event that happened very spontaneously and quickly. And um, that's probably where the misconception comes from. It's just because it's, there's usually a, a general brush over, I think, a lot of times, especially when it comes to, um, I don't know, maybe like shows and stuff like that. When they talk about the Big Bang, they think, oh, yeah, that's what initiated everything. And that's 
you know, this is the origin of the universe. So that's probably, I think, why I own, I get that a lot from people because they think, oh, well, the name, it just says Big Bang. And, and that's usually what starts anything. Um, as opposed to looking at it as a thing that actually uh, was a, a, a moment, a point in time that initiated a, um, a growth after that. So that, that's so it's, kind it's of my a, viewpoint. Just a misnomer in some ways, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, remember, remember that the Big Bang term was, a, uh, was, was originally coined by Fred Hoyle on a radio program to derive you know, basically as a mocking the theory right there was there yeah. was, right you know using people were using terms like uh, primeval uh, atom or primeval nucleation or something of that form and uh you know hoyle sort of said well it sounds like they're trying to to you know um describe a big bang right and and that that was meant to sort of mock the thing but that that moniker kind of stuck and so we we talk about big bang that... cosmology do you think it'll uh, the name will ever change? Like even uh, generations in the future, a century later, it'll be uh, uh, have a better name. <laughs> yeah, I, I personally do because I, honestly, if they relate quantum mechanics to like uh, general relativity, there's going to be something newer and bigger and better that comes out of these these theories. Yeah, yeah. I remember you, uh, Brian Cox called it a um, everywhere expansion. <laughs> everywhere expansion. Yeah, but again. Yes. It, yeah. So, so, so the, the, the theory talks about that our universe began in a hot, dense state and it's still expanding out this initial event. And the, you know, matter of the universe is approximately, uh, 80% hydrogen, 20, you know, 90% helium, 1% lithium, blah, blah, blah. It, it states things like that, but, but it's, it, it talks about how the universe began, not what was there beforehand. But but theories don't need to explain everything, right? The, right, the, right, and then, and uh, that's that's a good point. Um, even within the Big Bang theory, there are other theories to explain things, which we'll be getting into. Mm -hmm. All right. So the Big Bang basically explains the inflation of space time. Basically, so next slide. And by the way, don't forget, people, go sub to, to Athena while we're waiting for this. I want to see those numbers kind of go up, people? Uh, okay, because in the video description, you can go to her link. Come on. We got like 200 people that can go <laughs> right now and do it. So, I write um, out the big bang and inflation. <laughs> yeah, she, she, you, I'm yeah. not kidding. Go check out her videos. I mean, you guys are gonna be impressed. Um, so, yeah. anybody can talk about wave function you should be you should be automatically a su uh, sub to. So, so this is where we start getting into the actual science, big bang and inflation, because the if you look to the right, the big bang will show various epochs of time. From the point of wherever, whatever was where the universe began, where the, the this hot, like you said, this hot, dense um, universe started cooling off, and you started having things like recombination periods, where um, the all these ionizations would allow for atoms to start being neutralized by protons absorbing left or not absorbing, so uh, uh, taking electrons and making neutral atoms. Um, this reionization is the opposite of ionization. And then, obviously, you know, they had matter forming, but you also had things like the quartz being formed and this glue, gluonic soup and all this other stuff. But the, 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 the main thing is that there was a period of time that was very, very short. I think it was around 10 to the negative 30, 30, 32 seconds, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the inflation period. Somewhere around that ballpark. Um, it depends, and oh, yeah. that that's one of the things that that people are trying to determine, pin down, is is when the inflation period started and stopped. But one of the important things to note is it was mentioned also in the chat is that the Big Bang um, starts out with a non-inflating universe, right? Inflation comes later. The Big Bang event, mm -hmm. and then you get inflation, and then inflation um, um, stops or slows down. Right. Most, okay, so most right, models, right. most Big Bang models that have inflation start with a with a Big Bang, and then bring in inflation, and then inflation yeah. turns off. To, to right. Oh, so what was what, what was the main reason why they came up with the inflationary model in the begin with? I have three different reasons, which we'll get into. Which was the obviously the cosmic um, horizon problem, the monopole problem, and the flatness problem. But why did we need it to actually come up with something to explain these things away? Well, okay, I'll jump in. Um, one thing is that you, you see kind of a, 
uh, a, a funnel happening here. And that's something that um, right now is has been uh, a way to sort of explain what we see currently happening in the universe. So coming from an observational standpoint where, you know, we weren't around when the Big Bang happened, but we are around now and we see everything around us moving away at an accelerated rate known as the Hubble constant. And so you see this constant expansion. So if you were to go backwards and rewind that, like as if you're, you're rewinding, um, obviously just ourselves, then you'll start to see that obviously this is where right now we're in expansion, but that had to have retracted and then that, and then you keep getting smaller, smaller, smaller until you get to the big bang. So for me, this is kind of a, a basic way to sort of explain that. I know someone can go into more of an elaborate way, like you said, bringing up the other models, but that's really where inflation came in because it serves as a funnel to explain to the point that we're at today and then where we're going. One of the that things that, that happened early on with the history of this theory is that um, the assumption was it's that, 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 that the theory states that the universe began with a hot, dense, uniform uh, state. And the question that was asked is, well, how did it get to this non-uniform, you know, lumpy universe that we have today? And, and the, um, there were, there, they began to run into problems if they assumed that things just magically decided to, 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 to clump up. Um, because in that early universe, the universe was able to equalize. So if, if there was any fluctuation that caused some part of the universe to get hotter, it's, you know, the energy was, was quickly dissipated throughout the rest of the universe. The universe was compact enough that things could equalize. And then, but, but that's not the case today. And so inflation was an attempt to try to take Big Bang cosmology and actually put it on a sound footing with respect to the observations that we see today. Um, work is going on right now uh, at the South Pole uh, there was an initial attempt with something called BICEP2 that was looking at supposedly they're looking for evidence of the effects of of the uh, you know in, in in inflation state and um, there were some problems with the data in particular there's some stuff that they couldn't rule out with regards to dust uh, uh, complicating their measurements so BICEP3 is being conducted right now where they're using a multi-wavelength uh, set of measurements. And when I was there in, in January, um, the people were very pleased with the performance of the instrument. Obviously, they're not going to reveal the data that they're collecting, but they say that, that the instrument is working well um, and um, they're, they're expecting to be able to um, have data to analyze uh, on, on, on schedule. Okay, I think that kind of that works. That data will help us understand. Uh, that data will help us understand things such as for example they're looking at the 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 last time that uh photons um bounced off of 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 uh, essentially um gravitational waves that were in um in the early universe now you're talking about the period of time where the universe was kind of opaque and that um, there's just like a sea of electrons light couldn't really escape yes. and then the recombination period happened electrons combined with uh, protons to form neutral atoms, and then that all that photonic energy that was there was allowed to burst out um, in a cosmic flash, yes. and that's what we, we see now as the cosmic microwave background radiation, correct? Yeah, and, and yes, and those, 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 that, that last ricochet before the universe went trans, you know, um, transparent um, imparted a particular um, uh, polarization on that, that material. And so they're looking at that polarization um, and and there's properties that if we have these you know uh, ways for example that 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 LIGOS you know was able to detect that were dominant in the end of the universe um, that were uh, part of the result of the inflation period then they should have these certain properties so they're trying to detect the the last ricochet before the universe went transparent and pin down perhaps um, when when the inflation period might have started and stopped. Okay, next slide, and then we're going to dive into each of these. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully they always get good data. All right, so the the I call it the cosmic event horizon problem. You call it the horizon homogeneity 
problem. Um, or hermet ho homogeny or hermet uh, homogeneity? How do you prefer it? I call homogeneity. it homogeneity, but homogeneity. Okay. Um, so hom horizon homogeneity problem. Um, basically, how could regions of space that are too far away due to the speed of light remain homogeneous, effectively at the same conditions without some kind of mechanism that sets the same initial conditions everywhere? So w when we look at the, the background of radiation, why is it st so similar with a small, very small temperature differential? Why are, the, why are the constants the same? Why is the fine structure constant similar in all points in the universe? And I'm going to kind of let um, Dr. Kroon kind of jump in on this one. Um, why is it that we see a lot of uh, homogeny in the universe, uh, but it's still we still see, we see many many things like answering entropies, um, which are irregularities in the cosmic microwave background radiation as well. And is, is that somehow set from the whatever the initial conditions were of the Big Bang? Is that what we're seeing now, the result of those things? Uh, yeah, kind of. Um, well, yes. Um, but w one thing that I, I did read about is how they were trying to look at uh, variations in the speed of light. Um, arbitrarily far back in time to look for variations in any of the uh, fundamental constants of the universe that um, dictate the speed of light um, and, and, and other things such as the wavelength of uh, hydrogen um, embalmer emission lines and they, they, they found that essentially the, the speed of light has not changed so it, it seems like the, the laws of physics and the, the constants of the universe were um, constant um, to a very high degree throughout the age of the universe. So there's a there's a natural relationship between all these natural units, right? So when you have like gravitational constant, you have like the speed of light, you have um, Planck's constant, you have the fine structure constant. There's a relationship between all of these. Is there not such that if any one of them changed, Many ones, all the other ones would change somehow, including the speed of light, because the speed of light is very dependent upon a thing like the fine structure constant, and as well as electric and magnetic permittivity and permissivity, right? So if we did have the speed of light change in the initial conditions, could it be feasible to even say that our universe would not even be the way, would not be the way we know it now? Yeah. So a good thing that yeah, it hasn't. Like you, yeah, the uh, speed of light uh, which is dependent on the permittivity and the permeability of free space, um, uh, but would show up again in things like the fine structure constant, which um, which dictates things about like the the strength of chemistry. You know how chemistry happens that would affect the biology and um, molecular forces that um, you know bind uh, comets and, and and planets together under the action of gravity, there would definitely be a, a very a different universe if you changed any of these by a, a lot, or even a little. Okay, so the, so the inflation model was put out there to try to resolve this particular measure. Um, hum, hum, I hate this word. Oh, homogeneity. <laughs> I, call, I, say, I call it homo, homogeneity. I say it like you. I say it the way you do. Homogeneity. I say it, but he says it otherwise. So I guess it's like potato, but not potato. But it is homogenous. So. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard. Well, I've heard when people say homogenous that that's wrong. That it's homogeneity. Really? See, I, oh, I don't. I guess homo it's homogeneity. Like what part of? Uh, yeah. You know part what? Of I'm going to go with it. Go ahead. Part of my hey, dissertation look at, look at how, had uh, in inhomogeneous what? and homogeneous. Okay, yeah. so your dissertation you use homogeneity. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Wait, we can get this right. So. Uh, uh, Athena's going to be the tiebreaker, so hang on. Uh, Dr. Kroon, you say what? Uh, for this particular word, homogeneity. And homogeneous, for it's the, the other homogeneity. version of that. Okay, Landon, do you agree? Yes. Homogeneity? Okay, Athena? Yep, homogeneity. We're going to go with homogeneity then. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> this, is, this is not my optic we get on this program. We have to make sure that we pronounce homogeneity correctly. All right, next, next slide. She's never coming back, people. Okay, next slide. Uh, she's like, what am I I'll getting myself into? I'll make a whole video into? about homogeneity. Exactly. We might, we might have started a whole new uh, series, the homogeneity series. Okay, so the homogeneity problem, um, the, the solutions were the cosmic inflation model, which we had talked about. And I think you mentioned, obviously, uh, the variable speed of light model. Uh, you kind of touched on that, that they were kind of playing around with if the speed of light can change, that would kind of solve this issue. 
right? And the reason why we pick one mm -hmm. over the other is because there's there's really no evidence that the speed of light has changed. Would that be a fair summation? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I mean, by the way, yeah, like, 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 that. like the fine, 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 fine structure constant, other things, it would, would be relative as a uh, would be observing a radically different universe if the speed of light were, were variable. And so yep. the two possible solutions, cosmic inflation and VSL consider, but uh, you know, observational evidence favors inflation model and not variable speed of light. You're, you're breaking up a little bit, Landon, but yeah, we got most of that. We got, we got uh, most of it. Uh, I'm sorry, the younger creation that, that, out there. Yes. Just hang on. Right. Uh, the younger creation out there, there's a couple of them watching. Uh, pay attention to this because this shits all over younger creationism right now. So just <laughs> bear in mind that <laughs> when they talk about things like accelerated decay, they talk about things like um, uh, asynchronous light. Yeah, not going to happen. So because we exist and there is those zero. Things were true, we were not exist. There is zero evidence that the speed of light in a vacuum um, changes. And that's good that you mentioned that because we are talking about C, which is speed of light in a vacuum. Speed of light is a constant in a vacuum. Can light be slowed in various mediums? Yes, of course. But that's not what they mean by changing the speed of light. All right, next slide. The monopole problem. Um, a large number of very massive, stable magnetic monopoles, theoretical particles with a net magnetic charge, basically a magnet with one end, uh, could have been produced early in the universe due to spontaneous symmetry breaking from a single gauge theory. Why have no mono stable monopoles been ever been observed? Now, I'm going to turn this one to Landon, because Landon kind of rewrote this. Um, I had my version of it, but he's rewrote it. Um, why, why do we have to care about the monopole problem, um, and what actually is it uh, in relationship to the Big Bang? Well, there's a thing called gauge theory that would uh, would state that we should have these uh, particles, theoretical particles, with a with a net net magnetic charge that should have been created, and the assumption is that these these particles, um, you know, um, should be out there. So people went and looked for monopoles, and um, the and the problem was that we're not finding them. Um, now, are we not finding them because we don't know how to look? We're not finding them because they don't exist. We're not finding them because they're rare. Well, the 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 way that the you know, universe uh, again, there should have been massive stable monopoles um, according to the the models that we use, and we don't see them. So what happened? Now that doesn't mean they don't exist. Like correct me if I'm wrong. We've discovered monopoles. Um, we've discovered decay things in monopoles, but they're Induce, either they've been they've been produced somehow. They're not primordial monopoles that we're talking about because those would have long since decayed. But we've had we have discovered monopoles exist, right? Anybody? Um, um, not to my knowledge, not that, that would be uh, not, not to my knowledge. I don't know. I've, I've, I've read things up. They've just yeah. they've they found they found decays that they would expect from a monopole. Um, so mm. I have read things out there that if it discovered. That these monopoles do exist, but they're not primordial. Well, I could obviously be completely wrong on that, but we'll have to look into that. But from what I remember reading, they did find decays that they would expect from from monopoles. What they would if they did they did could exist. I, could you maybe have been thinking about condensed matter physics monopoles? No, which is a, no. a different. Okay. Yes. Well, I mean, yeah, well, I mean, possible. I mean, the way I look at condensed mon matter. Uh, okay, I, condensed energy is is matter, and then condensed matter would be like Einstein's always constant, right? Yeah. I, uh, very very cool cryogenetic stuff. Heli uh, helium yeah, frozen but... down to absolute zero, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I think I, it, th th that might be it. I mean, because they do they have things that are basically what we would look for, what a, mon a monopole would look for in those kind of condensates. Well, but but again, I don't. I'm, I'm looking over the literature again, and I don't see that that there has been ever a, a confirmed uh, detection of a monopole. Okay. I'm looking well, around. I'm not. Look, I'm not seeing anything. I, I was just checking to be sure. Um, now there are quote monopoles in in condensed matter systems, but that's a different thing. That's not talking about a, a, a fundamental particle. Okay, that could be what I'm referring to. All right, next. You know, there, there, are, there are certainly people that talk about, you know, micro, 
macroscopic black holes are potential magnum bonum poles, but that's a, a Einstein Rosen bridge stuff. So, okay. Um, so the monopole problem continued. Um, the pre inflation monopoles, they would not be stable if they existed, right? So they would have decayed. We wouldn't, we wouldn't detect them if they don't exist. Um, they became, or they became separated from each other very early on because of inflation, and they have a very, very low density, which I would apply, there's not very many of them. And then that it's more likely that they're not stable because we've been looking for them and we haven't found any, according to what Landon's saying. Is that correct? Yes. So, so think about it this way: that that that, that gauge rays should have suggests that we should have created monopoles. But uh, if uh, one of the things you get with inflation is that the is between the Big Bang and the start of inflation, you would have um, either had monopole decay, or if monopoles that monopoles weren't stable, but if the ones that survived would be at a very low density today, um, that they were created pre-inflation and um inflation separate them out so now they're so uh, so sparse that we're having fine difficulty finding them yeah gotcha all right next slide the flatness problem oh, um, yeah. small deviations in density of matter and energy omega not would create extreme effects in the universe we know today. Why does the universe appear to have a flatness of one to within one part of 10 to the 62? Now, the way I remember this, the local geometry we've discovered is flat. It's up to like six sigma or something. You say it's higher. Um, but wh why does the Big Bang, or why does the inflation theory in Big Bang kind of resolve this flatness problem? Landon? I mean, one of the things that 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 happened is, is with the you know, according to the model is that um, the the universe was able to uh, during this in inflation period was able to um, start off with a a very um, okay actually let's back up what do we mean by flat? Um, that's the first, I guess, one of the first first things you have to have to define. Let's 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 first of all define our terms. When we say the universe is flat, what um, I guess a lay person's way of saying is that um, you know right angles are at ninety degrees, parallel lines don't meet. Um, that 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 for example, a non-flat universe would be where the universe curves in on itself, right? That it that it, that it looks more like a um, a surface of a three-dimensional or uh, four-dimensional sphere as opposed to um, being flat everywhere. So um, do when when you when you put a large triangle into the universe, um, do all the um, you know three points do do this do the angles of the three points um, sum up to 180 degrees? And you might say, well, well, of course, because that's what triangles are. Well, if if space is curving, then you could have your your vertices of the triangles come out much narrower and 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 splay out. So you could have, for example, if you take a a surface of a ball and and put three points on that ball and and you know draw the line, draw the great circles between those three points, and measure the angles, you won't see um, a hundred eighty degree triangle. Now, um, now, space is not linear, though. The, the, I mean, it, it is curved, though, right? Yes, but the question is, 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 is how how curved is the overall cosmos? Is it, or is, is the grid of space relatively uniform? You can. I'm not talking about local distortions. In it. I'm talking about the, the, the overall big geometry of the universe. Is it, is it flat? Yeah, well, well it growing up, is like it, when I would be like Paul Davies, it was said that if you took a telescope and had an infinite amount of power, you could see the back of your head. Does that no longer apply? Um, um, I would say. Go ahead. I would say no because um, because the 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 observe well. So we have our own um, essentially like any any whenever you look off in any direction, like we're at the center of our own observable bubble of the universe. So like. Um, you wouldn't just require infinite power, you would require um, infinite time and a bunch of other okay. crazy stuff for light to be able to 
curve sure, not just course. around the space part, but also the time part. And so um, I, I never heard that before. It's an interesting thing to ponder there. Yeah, if you were to well, look through a telescope, I'm trying to just imagine it, you would have to outpace the rate of expansion of the universe in order to try and not even not, not even just go faster than the rate that we're expanding, but to be able to then see yourself again. That that would Yeah, this makes certain <laughs> that really is interesting. It, it, it to obviously think about. doesn't take into account right. acceleration, cosmic expansion. I mean, this is a very yeah. right. s simple thing that they used to say giving, you know, just just based upon power, not not taking into account the time element. But that's only trying to relate the curvature right. factor, right? So you know, uh, we but don't but now, Steve, you're correct. The universe is pretty well. It's it's the accelerating universe that says no. You're not going to see the back of your head, even if the geometry right. would otherwise allow it. I mean, think about when we talk about an object being five billion light years away. Um, what do we mean? What we mean is that at the time when light left that object right, that we see, seeing an object five billion light years, um, the universe was of a size such that it took light 5 billion years to reach us. Um, mm -hmm. Our now is there, includes there then back 5 billion years ago. But if you talk about, if you want to send a signal back to that same object that was where we saw light traveling to us for 5 billion years, it's not going to take 5 billion years to reflect that light back. It's going to take more than 5 billion years because the universe is, is expanding. Now, that's not inflation. Inflation is a no. different thing, but that's expansion right. of, of, of a universe. Due to dark energy, they hypothesize. Yeah. Okay. There, there, uh, okay. There is this thing, yeah. there's this thing we have to talk about in terms of, of density of matter, uh, matter and energy in the universe, um, where if if again it's, it's that it's that omega naught uh value if it's one then um the universe will be essentially a flat or as example if if the if you had a curvature that was was um greater than than one then the surface of space would be more would would, would wrap around on itself would be would be would be enclosed you might think of it like like a sphere what do you mean with sphere? Well, um, if you take the dimensions, our three dimensions, and map them onto a four-dimensional sphere, does it reach around and, and as you say, um, meet itself? Ignoring the fact that 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 you couldn't see the back of your head, would 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 the geometry cause the lines to wrap around the universe and come back to you? Um, like going around on the surface of a, of a sphere gives you a two-dimensional analog of this wrapping around. Um, right, there but is a we wouldn't, less than we wouldn't zero, now because of the, the expansion, right? Because when I, we didn't know the universe was accelerating when I was a kid, by the way. That's actually, yes. I think, what, 90s or something. Um, so that's relatively yeah. new. Yeah, 98. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I wasn't a kid in 98 any longer, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but yeah, back back in the early, back in, you know, when I was, you know, in high school, that's the way they kind of related it. But anyways, next next slide. This is um, I'm going to turn this one completely over to you guys because I know nothing about topology. So um, you guys can have at this because these are some of the potential solutions. I don't want to get into too much detail um, on this because I think it kind of goes away from the whole Big Bang thing. But do you want to touch on this real quick since you wrote this, Landon, and then maybe Dr. Kroon can um, weigh in on it a little bit, and then Athena. Oh, okay. So so one of the solutions is to say that essentially the inflation stretched out uh, space time to, 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 to be flat, right? That you did not, you might have had um, a, a different geometry in the pre-inflation universe, but the inflation, the rapid, you know, doubling in sizes um, over a very, very short period of time of, 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 of space um, stretched things out to become a flat or at least close to as flat as we can observe today. There is a different uh, a theory, uh, Einstein, that, that, that is possible to, to, to be invoked, um, which, which is sort of Einstein um, um, Cartan theory that um, talks about essentially that, that the theory, um, it removes the constraint of symmetry of what's called um, 
the 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 torsion basically that torsion since tensor becomes a dynamic uh, as a dynamic variable um so um you can get um you can get interesting stuff about you know the fact that it gives correct um um you know data for conservation laws for the total angular minimum let's say in, in of matter in presence of gravity um but it it um it it's assuming something called a, a, a that 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 you have these sort of things called Dirac uh spinners that are obeying um these nonlinear Dirac equations they're trying to come up with a way that that that, that is that is an alternate to how um how the universe could be, be, be become flat. Um, it, it would, um, it, Einstein Cartesian theory would, would assume that, um, the universe will, um, have rapid expansion followed by a, a, a contraction and a balance. Um, and that's something that's troubling the, that the particular theory, because it appears now that we're in, in an inflation only, um, period, but, um, what to say is that there are two possible solutions. One is during inflation, space got stretched out to to to, to where where again you know right angles are ninety, 90 degrees. The geometry is, is 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 regular in the type of grids you you typically see in graph paper, um, or that um, uh, there's there's a uh, alternate theory that you know, you, you know revolving around um, you know. Um, Torsion tensors and nonlinear Dirac equations that could also explain it without uh, inflation. However, All right. uh, if if inflation is fixing, it, it, it seems to be favored in fixing the monopole problem, and is it seems to be you know, favored in terms of homogeneity problem. Um, uh, one might uh, also see that inflation could also fix the correctness problem. That's one of the reasons why um, Einstein Cartan has not been ruled out. But uh, it certainly is is not favored because inflation is fixing the other two uh, big bang problems so well. All right, Dr. Green, do you want to kind of add anything to that? Because um, probably this most of this yeah. is over most people's head. I think I think the main point is the anthropic principle, but um, which I can explain obviously that if, if it weren't one, we wouldn't be here. The anthropic principle is that the universe is such that we are here to observe it. Um, if we, you know, we we are we are creatures that are allowed to observe the universe in a way such that we. Um, we exist. I mean, if 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 we if we didn't exist, we couldn't observe the universe. So, but how right. how would I mean how would you kind of resolve this flatness problem using um, the Einstein Cartan theory in a nutshell? I want to get too well, deep in it? Well, yeah, and in lieu of um, uh, in lieu of not repeating uh, the very elegant way that Landon described it and all the stuff we have on the slide, I would just add. Um, the something that I've always found to be kind of interesting, or at least noteworthy, which is that if you consider, um, if you think about the uh, Big Bang from the lens of a sort of like um, quantum, the quantum foam and the uncertainty principle, and you think about how the universe, well, um, just like anything else in the universe right now, can sort of pop into existence from nothing, borrow energy from nothingness, so long is that pops out of existence in less than that that delta t where delta t is uh, less than or equal to or greater than or equal to h bar you know over delta e whatever that uncertainty is you know the uncertainty principle um with the canonical variables energy and time um and so what's kind of neat is if you if you realize that once uh, let's call it a candidate universe has uh, popped into existence and at a quantum scale and it's still more or less a singularity. If there were a force that inflated it so fast that it became macroscopic before that delta T sort of expired and it was sort of required to, to pop out of existence, then it could sort of, quote, like grab hold of, of reality and become a real um, quantum universe that is, uh, is nascent and ever expanding and becoming even more uh, macroscopic. Well, so, so basically, the, it's a violation of, of uncertainty principle, though. I mean, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle would be a relationship between uh, position of a particle and its momentum, right? And you're saying there's an uncertainty principle with relationship to energy and time, and that a violation of that would cause the... Uh, uh, I would say a back door. 
Let's say just the same thing with like Hawking radiation. Like those particles are supposed to pop okay. back out of existence, but something else okay. that was unrelated to the um, the the principles that governed the initial appearance of these entities from nothingness um, caused it to go at a right angle to that that uh, originating principle, that original parad paradigm. And so the inflation is definitely something that even though there's there's all these um, all these ways to discuss it and study it. Uh, it I would I would almost uh, consider a placeholder word for something that we know happened or happens. You know, sort of like a, a different phenomenon, like a, a dark energy, which is, is is likely unrelated completely to it. But like I said, sort of a, a placeholder word for phenomenon that we infer out of necessity to have happened and can study some of its consequences. Uh, even in an indirect sense in the in the u universe today, making it uh, much more legitimate than a simple hypothetical um, well, well, um, a hypothesis, if you will, more of a, a model yeah. that works for what we see right now. And if you got something better, let us know, sort of a thing, you know? No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it makes sense that there's maybe a mechanism that allows for that. I mean, you're, you're, I think the analogy s s makes sense to me that people may not know, but like Hawking radiation is, if you have a boundary mm -hmm. condition on the black hole and you have a virtual yep. photon pair produced, there is a situation, depending on what orientation that they have to the boundary, that one photon can actually go into the black hole and the other one gets imparted to become real. They're not just virtual photons. There are real particles yes. that come out of that. And then you have a boiling away of a black hole. That's why they, you know, small black holes are going to boil away really fast, but larger black holes, not so much. But we can actually detect this radiation. We know that it exists, and we know the mechanism behind it now. So it's, you're saying that you think it's, it's, it might it's, be a it's, mechanism. It's a curvature issue, right? The, the, the small black holes have high That's to do with the surface area of the black hole, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But, yeah, this but, actually okay, ties in good. really well with the, the, the no boundary proposal. Just to jump in really quick with Dr. Kroon yeah, said, please, please. and that's that's awesome. And I know we're, we're leading into that in a couple slides. Um, but that's just really really interesting to think about because also what what Landon was saying, and I never thought of it this way before. He said that we're kind of in a stage right now that is sort of like an inflation period because we are expanding. So right now, does it mean that this ties into then that uh, we may potentially end up? resulting in a big crunch where if we actually formed out of existence, then we can fall out of existence just as quickly. And this also, again, would tie right into what Dr. Kroon was saying about the no boundary proposal, which was taking quantum mechanics and he applied it, Stephen Hawking applied it directly to black holes and started measuring, as you said, like as can actually measure Hawking radiation that when a particle enters the black hole, part of it's irradiated, radiated back out into the universe where exactly it will boil out of existence. And so if this is possible, where you can take the mathematics of quantum mechanics and apply that into the macro scale and the cosmos, then does that mean that those two can actually go hand in hand? Because the homogeneity problem, well, not problem, but the, the observation of, of the universe being um, homogeneous and seeing that physics applies to all the universe, physics changes when it comes to the quantum scale. So if you use the physics from, from the quantum scale and the way that quantum particles work and apply that to the uh, massive, uh, so you, it's into atoms and then the mass scale of the universe, then does that mean that what we may observe happening uh, to particles on the quantum scale actually be happening in the macro scale, meaning multiverse, meaning, you know, a superposition of particles? Does it mean that we're existing here and also somewhere else? But that'll tie into quantum physics we can get into another time. But um, yeah, I just thought that that was interesting that he was bringing that up about um, the different principles from the no boundary proposal um, uh, principle itself. So I, I yeah, I, I just wanted to chime in about leader. that a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a, that's so, a brilliant so, leader. You know, now, again, wait, 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 that's where people on the outside, know that, this is why we're talking about each one of these topics. She just literally just did my presentation in a, in a nutshell. Oh. That's brilliant because <laughs> these, are weird, these are why, these are, <laughs> no, that's great. Because people, kind of, people might be going, well, what does this have to do with the topic? There, there is a correlation here. There's a reason why I pick, picked these particular things to talk about to try to discuss yeah. this topic. And I think that you did a brilliant way of pulling that all together. So uh, who was, who was no, There's, there's, there's several things also to, to under, understand. You know, when you're talking about cosmic inflation, we're, we're talking about you know, the typical model says that it, an epic that began, you know, so, lasted somewhere around uh, 10 to the minus 36 seconds, a really tiny bit of time. 
and that you know the Big Bang Solaris that that and 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 it and it and it's and that this the the notion that 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 in the inflation where the universe began to rapidly expand that rapid expansion the the the, the extreme rate of expansion slowed down and 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 today continues um at a, at a less expansion rate so one of the things that um most models say inflation kicked off shortly after the big bang and, and we had a rapid period of time and that 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 slowed way down um, for some reason today, where we have a, um, a a less rapid rate. It used to be that we said inflation turned off, and because we didn't know that our universe was was still um, um, was still expanding or accelerating, but um, now now with observational data we know better. Um, I want to be back to well, why why do we bring up this Einstein Cartesian theory? Um, one of the things that the Einstein Cartesian theory does is it give, it averts the need for a big bang singularity um instead it replaces it with a bounce that uh, the universe has sort of a minimum scale factor perhaps at, at at the Planck level and that um what may what what Einstein kind theory might favor is a universe that is cyclic where it it, it expands stops contracts and bounces off itself and so the the big bang was the last bounce um, where it didn't reach singularity, didn't reach an, an, an independent density. It it there was a minimum scale that um, the universe bounced off of. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up because we we that kind of goes into the whole time element that we're going to be getting into um, the big bounce over the big bang. But the big bang is just part of the big bounce, right? I mean, yeah, the big bang yeah. is not exclusion, so, so exclusionary. Remember. Remember that, bounce, right? that, that the rapid expansion immediately after the, 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 the bounce explains why the present universe appears to be spatially flat, homogeneous, and isotropic, right? Um, but the question is, did it come from a singularity or did it come from a, a minimum scale? Gotcha. And, um, and that's, that would, um, so this is an alternate way to explain what? The flatness. Right. This doesn't say that Einstein Cartesian theory disagrees with inflation. It may be that um, inflation is that, that 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 if we have if the Einstein Cartesian uh, I think it's uh, Shaima Kibble theory of gravity is 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 reasonable, then that we have a minimum scale that they don't have singularities. Then you can um, get a from that, you can get a flat universe without the need for a singularity at the beginning. Um, inflation can still happen. It doesn't mean that inflation didn't happen. It just means there's an alternate way that you could get um, a, um, a, a a flat universe or a purely okay. flat universe. Right, we got we got to pick up the pace a little bit here. Um, we're over an hour right now. Um, Sorry, Athena, do you want to? Dense. That's okay. I know you can go on forever. Um, <laughs> do you want to add anything? We go to the next slide, Athena. I'm good. I'm good. Kind of <laughs> okay, next slide. She's like, I'm not following that. Um, uh, I wouldn't like, either. I mean, Atlantic, 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 pretty. I've seen I'm him do it, it actually. Uh, oh, eight hours long, really yeah. just talking about <laughs> science, specific topic. I mean, he can do it. Um, okay, so why is this? Why is this an important question um, to the initial question? Why is it important to the initial question? Do you understand why Big Bang theory and inflation theory makes the initial question nonsensical? Um, we're going to dive into a little math here. Now, I want to warn you people, this is going to get a little mathematical. So if you have any math phobes out there, you can take them out of the room now. We don't mind. Um, take, go, go get some caffeine or something or, because um, <laughs> we don't want your brains to implode, okay? Because you, ha you have to deal with math sometimes. It's just a reality yeah. of, of dealing with these topics. So we're going to just kind of dive right into it, and then we'll let these experts here kind of explain the details. But let's go to the next slide. Yeah, well, you do, right? I mean, you got to have some math and physics, right? Is this math? Thing around? That's a good term. That's a good term. Math folks. <laughs> yeah. math folks. We have a lot of math folks. So, uh, the Hartle Hawking state basically is the conditions for the no boundary proposal we're going to be talking about. Um, basically, what, what he po hypothesized what would happen if we can re eventually rewind the universe to t equals zero. Now, that's just given the assumption that, you know, time is some kind of. Um, 
an ongoing thing. We have an error of time, which is based upon entropy. The error of time is considered to be the difference in time, difference between entropic states from uh, lower to higher, because we all know that the universe is increasing in entropy. And they basically hypothesized what would happen if we just kind of rewound the universe. And as Landon pointed out, does it get to a mathematical singularity, or kind of get to a, can, can it get to a, a boundary condition where we don't have that singularity occur? Because um, we all know by now, general relativity breaks down at time equals zero, right? General relativity can't really model what happens at that singularity. Now you can evolve things like called loop quantum gravity to help do that, which the no boundary proposal, as far as I understand, kind of does, but loop quantum, gra quantum gravity and general relativity don't play well with each other. They don't like each other. So they're kind of incompatible as it stands now. Um, would you agree that's a kind way, of a I fair should, summation? I point out, yes, I yes. want to point out what you mean by not compatible is that you'd have to go from, if you said loop quantum gravity is reasons, you have to say, well, how do you go from loop quantum gravity to general relativity? Right, because we see the you know, general relativity is 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 measured, has been measured and well confirmed multiple times, directly and indirectly. So, how would you go from a loop quantum gravity did it to we have quantum rel general relativity today? That's probably the bigger hurdle that you'd have to overcome. You, everybody else agree? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. And so this is. So this is kind of describing the conditions to the Planck error, prior to the Planck error. Planck error um, ended 10 to the negative 43 seconds, I, I think, wasn't it? We're going to go with that. Yes. That's usually a long, long time unit, yes. OK. Yes. Next slide. OK, so this, I, I wrote this, and I, I'm going to run it by you guys. This is how I kind of look at it. And you just have to tell me if this makes sense to you all. Um, the way I look at it, uh, for quantum loop gravity versus general relativity, general relativity thinks space-time is more of a four-dimensional, what's called Minkowski space. Um, basically, space-time is integrated. It's a, a manifold, to so, so to speak. Uh, where you have, uh, opposed to a Neil Lorentzian model, where you have three spatial dimensions with one time dimension, um, in each case, space-time is ma space -time is malleable. We know that it can, can, can basically have deformation, because that's all gravity is, mass, uh, deforms space-time. Um, we also think they can actually rip, uh, what's called the, the big rip. Um, but there's not a preferred frame of reference in general relativity. Ma means that wherever you are, that's your preferred, that's that's your frame of reference, but there's no preferred frame of reference for the entire universe. So there's no such thing as absolute time. Um, one of the things that they talk about is relativity of simultaneity. So if you have two events that are spatially separated and they occur at the same time relative to a frame of reference to the observer, but they're not absolute such that from different frames of references, they would actually see one event happen prior to the other one. How, how do you guys think that that kind of relates to to the uh, well? Just, what I just made makes sense. First of all. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. It does. Okay, so I'm not way off. Uh, not field. I think I go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it definitely, you know, makes sense just coming from like a, a more of a, a basic observational standpoint um, as opposed to diving in deep with anything because I know we're about to do that. Um, but just I'm looking a at things like... I, I, I'm simple. I'm I mean, a simple yeah. man. <laughs> and I who usually, uh, I, I work with uh, kids a lot of times at museums, so that's kind of how I break down my science. But yeah, so when you think about that, exactly what you just said obviously makes sense because you think about it and you think about like, um, when you're when you are look at things from two different perspectives or whatever it is in the universe, one thing might be observed at a different time than another. Perfect example is the International Space Station is traveling a bit faster than we are, so they're actually aging a little bit slower than we are. So they see, you know, Earth uh, traveling at a certain rate, but then we see it traveling at a certain rate. And if you expand that into a much broader scheme of things in the universe, something much much further away, like a rocket ship, and um, this is just talking about like time dilation, and you take two uh, atomic clocks and you synchronize them and then you put one on the rocket ship and one here on Earth, um, it's going to see our clock ticking much slower and eventually might stop ticking because it's moving maybe at the speed of light. It's moving much faster than we are. And its clock is gonna still be ticking at normal rate. So it can do a full loop around something, let's say sort of like a, a black hole for instance. It can, if it for some reason can loop around a black hole and not get pulled in by its gravity, um, it may be traveling at about uh, twice the speed that we would be traveling here on Earth, which means that it people there would be aging 
um, at about half the rate that we'd be aging here on Earth. So what you kind of just said, and that's that's tying into a, a little bit different. Um, that's more about uh, special relativity, but. Yeah, it's 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 something that it has been calculated. It's been observed. We've actually done experiments about this. So that's uh, These are confirmed that's, things. Yeah, yeah. The relativity yeah. is confirmed. No matter what anybody tells yeah. you, it works. Yeah. Um, I'm a scientific instrumentalist, not a realist. Um, I think uh, maybe some we might have some scientific. Uh, I, I think what they call them. Uh, what do you call yourself, Dr. Kroon? You're that's not an wrong. instrumentalist, or what? Do you, what are you a I'm scientific? What? <laughs> I don't know. We were, we didn't. Finish. You have to. Yeah. You have to. We have to finish the discussion. We finish that conversation. Yeah, we didn't finish it. <laughs> what you call yourself? Would, you, had a, you, you had a term I hadn't heard before. A scientific. Uh, hold on. Well, it's, hold on. Uh, hold on. Hold on. I can go back to he my. Wrote, uh, he, he made up a term, and I liked it. Um, it but, it uh, made sense at the time, like in my defense. Yeah, no, I, I liked it. It was a good, it was a good coinage, actually. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't know what he was talking about. I've never heard this before. He's like, ah, I just kind of made it up. <laughs> but I was like, it works. Um, <laughs> I want to know what it is. We, what is it? Yeah, I don't I'll, know what I'll it look is. It and, really and, the, and the, and the, and the well, next Okay, so while minutes. he's looking it up, while he's looking it up, um, one of the things that that you're talking about in terms of you know measuring, she, she, she was talking about time dilation, right, and then time slowing down. Um, one of the things that's going to happen, um, there's a space probe called the Parker Space Probe that people focus on it's going to get really close to the sun do these these flybys to the sun to observe um, conditions now near the surface of the sun um, but one of the other th experiments is going to be doing is is another test of general relativity i don't know if you know about this but um when the, when the parker space probe is at its maximum speed where it's closest to the sun and zipping around and you know at, at, at its in its spot um it will be traveling um, close to 700,000 kilometers per hour. So that's about 430,000 miles per hour. Um, that's a non, very non-trivial speed. And we are going, it has, the, 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 the space probe has clocks on it for, for, for synchronizing events and, and, and sending out signals. And we're gonna watch from our standpoint, this clock zip around near the sun. It's going into a more intense gravitational field and we'll see time literally slow down for it, right? It will, um, time will run on that spacecraft at a slower pace than, than what we see here on Earth. And we'll actually with measure that to, to a very fine degree. Yes, with respect to us. We have to know, we have to know um, with respect to us. us. Uh, if, you're, if you're on that time, if you're on the, yes. the probe, you wouldn't notice a difference. Spacecraft, it'd be, it, it'll be, it'll it, We'd be you, actually you running fast. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. And so right, you you look back on the on the universe. Is there? But anyway, that's that's something that's going to be tested uh, very well. And well did, by the did way, you I find found out what it. You were for? What, was it? what was it called? Yeah. What was it called? So I'll read you the the full the little blurb I had. I said, "Am I a realist? A pragmatist? A scientific rationalist? There's probably a term for me. I think that third one is it. Does that sound familiar to you, Steve? No, I think you said you were science. You were because I asked like a scientific compatibilist or something. Because I I asked if you were uh, instrumentalist or a realist because a scientific realist would take a scientific theory and say this is actually the way the universe is, and a scientific instrumentalist just says you know what, it doesn't matter whether it is or isn't. We can use it to model. Oh, That's all oh, here we go. So I scrolled down more. You said that you're an instrumentalist, and I said, hmm, I'm kind of both. I'm what I might call a circumstantial instrumentalist. Which, circumstantial, yeah, that was good. That was good. Yeah. And I could think of scenarios that, that unambiguously conform to either parati paradigm. And then I said, I'm a mutant, yeah. lol. But, yeah, that was, that but, was actually but good. But never, never assume that the universe gives a damn about your theory. That's one of the things my advisor right. kept hanging right. in on saying. That's why I can't, take, that's why I can't, not, I can't it, adhere to it, scientific realism. It, it, it's very important here. The universe does not ask your permission to do what it does. So your there theory is does not tell the universe what 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 to do. Your theory is you you make a theory in order to try to predict what the universe is doing, and we accept or 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 reject your theory um, based upon evidence, based upon observation, right? That's, mm -hmm. So right, your theory, theory has to theory be observable, which, which it doesn't, doesn't prescribe do the way the universe must be. Yeah. Which is why the string model does not deserve the word theory at this point. Yeah. Well, I, I, really I, don't, I, I, I don't know. 
I mean, I've I I've been I'm just kind of still reading cosmic landscape, but uh, you know, as a mathematical, they call them theories in mathematics because the mathematics works for string theories, from as I understand. Well, so mathematics would be a way, the, But we're gonna oh, we're gonna we're gonna have, dive into string theory. This, we're we're this gonna this be here another five theory? hours. What um, is this math theory thing? Okay. <laughs> what, what is this math we're talking about? Uh, but uh, okay. real quick. Uh, I was, gonna, I was gonna say something else. Oh yeah, Athena, it's funny you mentioned um, time dilation and all that because this episode was originally gonna be just me and Dr. Kroon, I think, uh, and probably uh, landed, but I don't know if he was gonna be uh, available this week. But it was either this weekend or last weekend, last weekend I think it was, we were gonna talk about um, time dilation and uh, how neurons uh, show us that time dilation works, but we'll save that for another time. But next, next slide. But it's so funny you mentioned that because we were going to do a topic about it. What are the chances? Yeah, yeah that's funny. <laughs> cool, cool. All right, key points of general relativity. Um, general relativity, uh, the way I describe it, is it basically models the shortest geodesic path between two objects. So it's kind of like a straight line for curved space. Uh, general relativity holds time as emergent from three-dimensional space-time curvature. Um, this is due to energy distribution. So generativity really kind of thinks that time is an emergent property of space, and that's kind of a critical thing. Um, and that yeah. generativity maintains a classical trajectory between two points. Um, so if we wanted to get from A to B, we have to go through what we would call normal space time, and that is the shortest distance for us, even though there is, if you could actually like do a wormhole or something like that, you could theoretically make a shorter distance. Just like if I could tunnel my way through the earth, I can get to um, the equator faster th that way that I could going around the circumference, right? So that's kind of the key points for general relativity. Simple, but uh, want to add anything to that, anybody? Or is it pretty nope. basic? Uh, Hit the nail on oh the head yeah, there's there. always <laughs> that, uh, there's always that, uh, that thrifty saying that goes, uh, matter tells space-time how to curve and space-time tells matter how to move. That's always yep. uh, we yes. can't have a discussion of GR without that little thrifty turn of phrase. <laughs> Very and nice. as you can tell by the Very diagram, nice the phrase. sun is the body of mass, and it tells space time how to curve. It, 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 you, you literally are following the curvature of left of that potential energy well of wow. of the sun. Now, this is only a two dimensional wow. cross section. Remember, people. This by is the actually, way, that 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 diagram is not curved to scale. No, right. it's not curved to scale. Thank you, Landon. <laughs> People were kind of concerned. About it, I'm sure. All right, next, next point. <laughs> this is where we start getting into the fun stuff. So this is some of the key points of, of uh, uh, quantum group, right? Loop quantum gravity. So what's called? It's called what it uses is called the path integral formalization, and I'm going to have. One of you people talk about it here in a second. Um, but the PIF is basically a way to calculate every possible trajectory between two points and find the likely path between A and B for which a trajectory was taken. Now, um, the, the path identical formalization is literally based upon wave functions and that a particle will take all these different paths, but as you measure something, then it actually manifests only one path. But it is actually existing in all these different paths simultaneously, which is something weird mm -hmm. in quantum. Being in multiple places of multiple, at, you know, the same instance, but this what what it actually does is it looks at every single infinite amount of paths you can take from A to B, and basically has a formula that says all these paths are taking at the same time. That's the way I'm kind of looking at the path integral formalization. I know all three of you have talked about this before, so who wants to kind of jump in on this first? Well, and you don't take forever, start? so <laughs> <laughs> let it go ahead. I'm just kidding. Well, I mean, I know that Feynman um, did a lot of stuff with path integral formulation, and you know, he I remember him, him saying that that yes, because I was I was I was as a kid saying that seems kind of absurd. It said yes, one of the possible paths is a particle starts off, goes the opposite direction, goes down to the corner drugstore, goes around the the clerk three times, and comes back. That's a possible path, and that's one of the you know he was trying to illustrate saying that's one of the infinite paths that a particle can go from going from A to B. Um, but I said that that they can do the calculations because most of those more so-called ridiculous paths tend to cancel out, and what remains is the shortest possible trajectory between two points. Now these are yeah. possible. Except when you get in, I mean, there are there are paths yeah. that are just not possible, or as you said, most of them will cancel out in some way, right? Because they're based upon weight. Yes, when you're, when you're trying to when you're trying to calculate everything. The, 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 the functions around all these absurd paths. 
Yeah, it's like right. a, a quantum mechanical um, analog to the principle of least action. I mean, the the integrals mm-hmm. do yeah, exactly. involve the uh, the Hamiltonian operator, and you get uh, you pick up a phase, which will um, will those sort of sort of describe your your final amplitude for for these ridiculous paths, and you get a lot of cancellation from the math. You get these handy dandy uh, e to the minus. Yeah, one of these days. Oh, oh sorry. And right. then e to the positive i to the such and such, you know, and and there's a lot of cancellation there, and you get um, yeah, it's sort of it's a lot. There's a lot I can I could talk forever about that stuff. Well, it, and it's a f- and it's 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 a wonderful subject. And one of these days, I do want to get um, uh, a, a, somebody that I know. Her name's Jade. She did a wonderful presentation on, on this particular thing, and um, I wouldn't mind getting into some of the more complicated things because uh, I have a very, very basic understanding. Like all I know about a Hamiltonian operator, and you're probably gonna laugh at me, but as far as I understand it, the only thing it is is basically like the Hamiltonian of of, of, of a psi function is equal to the uh, basically different states of the energy of the psi function. So basically, they're eigenvalues and eigenstates of, of possibilities. That's that's the only way I can possibly relate a Hamiltonian operator because I've never really worked with them. Yeah, but they are related somehow to the the different Different ways you can have energy, um, energy relating to your psi function, something along those lines, eigenvalues and and adding vectors together for transformations. Yeah, you, I'm explaining you, it really you, poorly. Maybe you can kind of clean that up. Me, me or Landon? You. Yeah. So uh, you could think of the Hamiltonian as like a propagator. You know, it's T plus V, your kinetic energy plus your um, potential energy, and then and then remember the Lagrangian is the uh, kinetic energy minus the potential, but here we have T plus V, and so you you could write down these quantum mechanical operators that um, essentially depend on Q, which is your your coordinate, you know, like X Y Z, your position, which is related to um, uh, potential energy of the system, and you could write down the t- first time derivative of the coordinates P. Uh, sorry, Q, which give you um, your momentum. So you have P and Q, which are these sort of non-commuting, non-commuting operators. And so you, you might remember those those two guys from the um, uncertainty principle, delta P, delta X. Um, so they, they like to pair up. And so you have them both showing up in the Hamiltonian operator. Um, and you essentially add up all the possible paths, and they're weighted by um, the phase... Um, which pops out front, and you do do these integrals, and you get uh, well. Okay, so essentially the Fourier transform, um, so it's interpreted as a matrix multiplication. Multiplication, the sum over all states integrates over all the Qs, and takes the Fourier transform in Q, the change basis to P, um, and so the action is on the Hilbert space. You're 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 talking about. Um, the Hamiltonian propagator and phases that um, can, that ultimately determine uh, the amplitude, and so you get a lot of cancellation, and you get the more probable paths. You can still have multiple paths that the particle t- could take, but you just you may may not have all the ridiculous ones happening regularly. You'll still have a bunch of them that are um, possible to go from A to B. Um, but uh, it doesn't necessarily um, all cancel out to just one path. Uh, so you, you add them all you up know, we, and it's we, all we normal. We probably make a whole presentation on each of those, right? I mean, le, 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 you can, you, we can go into Fourier transformation. The only thing I remember, well, I did work with Fourier, that, but that was basically going from a frequency domain to a time domain. Um, Lagrange, I remember, uh, kinetic energy minus potential energy, is that right? Um, but, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I think that each one of those could, could probably spend about, you know, a whole two hours just talking about different way to do transformations, but they're all based upon matrix theory of some way. They're all talking about different vector spaces and Hilbert spaces that you mentioned. But uh, the path integral formalization, so th- this right here is a lot different than the way quantum, uh, GR looks at it, right? GR looks at a, a, a single shortest geodesic path, but the, the loop yes. of quantum gravity looks at an infinite number of paths, basically, right? And then yeah. takes, the, takes the summation and then finds the best possible path. Okay, next. So the, w- the way I would describe a wave function, and, and again, I'm going to turn over to you guys, but a wave function is something that describes a system. 
Um, you have the psi, which is your wave function, and your psi squared, which is the probability density. And the way that I kind of relate them is that if you have a wave function, that's going to give you, let's say you have a standing sinusoidal wave, like shown in the little diagram there. Let's say the first, um, we'll call that the first fundamental, and the second would be the next. So in this particular first fundamental, you would have um, a, a, a wave, a sinusoidal wave, right? That's the top half of a sinusoidal wave. And the probability density is basically the likelihood of finding a particle at a given position given that sinusoidal wave. So at the maximum amplitude of that wave, that is the, the area where I would most likely expect to find like an electron in orbital. Think of it as um, a range that electrons could exist uh, with respect to the nucleus. So they're in this, this bounded condition, we call them the s orbital or the p orbital or the d orbital. But they're bounded to such that you're not going to find an electron in a transition zone. You're not. You're going to find a very low probability of finding an electron near the point where the senior sign of wave starts to meet the x-axis. But as the senior sign of wave reaches its maximum, that's that's to be the most likely place you're going to find an electron. And in quantum mechanics, the electron is everywhere. It's existing the entire spectrum of that boundary, and it's not even at a specific point until this is actually observed which is another thing that's quite distinct from what we see in macro uh, scale. So the second one would be uh, that senior sign of wave. Each one of those is basically the top part would be, again, where the particles more likely to be found. The null would be where it hits the x-axis. So this is a relationship between the probability wave density and the wave function. Now, maybe you can kind of like expand upon that a little bit. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Athena, you want to take this one? You, you kind of you dealt with this one a little bit. Yeah, I'll jump into this one. Um, so branching off of actually what we spoke about just before this, it ties in well with this because as you said that there's two different behaviors happening um, when it comes to the macro scale and the quantum scale. And so this is is extremely important because we notice when, when observing um, uh, quantum particles and the way that they behave, um, there is something known as a double slit experiment where this, I'm just going to relate this for a moment, this is actually a, about a pathway, um, two, two different um, pathways, and shooting um, specific quantum particles through it. And they noticed that there was a whole scattered range of locations that the particles would hit on the backside of the, the double slit experiment. So this showed that its journey was all these different possibilities, right? Like you said, the, the, the path integral form formulation were all these different possibilities. And um, whereas with general relativity, and as you see in this first wave function, there's just one main possibility, whatever is the shortest uh, distance to get from point A to point B. And so the reason that this is important, and we're applying this obviously to, to the macro scale, is if you can find a way to make the mathematics in both formulas work together in one combined formula, then we may be able to actually figure out, okay, if, if this is how quantum particles behave, then maybe this is how the early universe might have behaved to actually uh, find, it's like an elimination process to find out which, um, I guess, which path did our universe take either before the Big Bang or just after the Big Bang. So um, again, I know I just kind of tied it all into the bigger picture, but um, with this, that's that's what's so great and what, why wave functions are being looked at um, on a, in a topic like this specifically, because obviously there's one, there's uh, wave functions of, of everything. And so I think that with um, trying to look at um, the cosmological scale, but on a quantum scale, so quantum cosmology is uh, very, very important in, in something like this to, to figure out just what happened before the, before the Big Bang. Yeah, I like that you tie it all together because the the no boundary kind of does treat the universe as a quantum object. And um, yeah. I think it was Dr. Green I was telling uh, before there was a, uh, I was talking about what's called a principle of supervenience that's in uh, philosophy. And the principle of super, uh, supervenience is basically that lower things affect higher structures. So even the smallest things will, will seem to be able to have very similar things as high, as you go higher up. And so these waveforms and wave functions and probabilities, even though they only happen at the quantum level, do have macroscopic analogies in some ways. Yes. So, mm -hmm. and you can talk about matter exactly. waves and things of that nature. So, um, but uh, anybody else want to add on this one? Or is that kind of just a very basic way of looking at wave functions? Good fun. So good, good fun. I, I'm right, good I'm fun. going to yes, yeah, good. I'm going to uh, resist the urge to go down the double slit experiment rabbit hole because that's a whole talk. We, we could do a whole stuff. presentation on that, couldn't we?
Yeah. I, oh, man, I, I keep love the double coming. split. <laughs> yeah, the double it's split. It's so good. <laughs> and, and as yeah, I know, that would be, uh, that'd be the, fun. We could the, do something like that. The triple split experiment and uh, multiple split experiments. I say it's one of Feynman's I, I uh, think... early re recording, talking about asking questions about that. Um, there's, well, have there's you seen the triple it. experiment where they yeah. did, where they have a photon goes in one, goes back through it in the middle, and comes out the other, basically? I did not it's see bizarre. That. It's I bizarre. It's, it's really bizarre. It take, it, the, the, the path that it took corresponds to basically going through one, coming through back through the middle, and going out the other one. It's really strange. Oh, that um, sounds they, like a crazy Saturday night right there. Yeah, um, <laughs> weird things happen in quantum. Um, again, not what you you would expect in the macro thing. But again, even in mathematics, you can have weird things happen, like the Tarski paradox. So you can have like one thing form two. But anyways, um, we're gonna that's gonna be on tangent. Uh, next slide. <laughs> By the way, it took some effort to try to distill this stuff down to the most basal way of explaining it. So I hope I'm do I'm not like like. Making it too simple, but at the same time, I'm hoping I don't go over his head because I, yeah, like a just you know, basal approach, just basics, you know, just the yep. bare minimum yep. to understand wave functions, right? I, I don't know how much more simple I could have made that. I like I think it. This I think is great. Did a great job. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because it's not easy. It's not easy taking and distilling a bunch <laughs> of stuff down. I mean, we all had wave mechanics. Wave mechanics is not easy. Okay, it sucks. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to try to get wave functions down to explain how the you know. Angular momentum and and propagation and phase and velocity and all that stuff. It's confusing, and so I had to like, what's the most easiest way to explain this? All right, so we're going to talk about real quick the normalization of a wave function, because again, I think that if you go look at the no boundary proposal and something like that, you kind of need to understand how you norm do a normalization of a wave function. And basically, a wave normalization is basically the wave function with respect to the position and time. If you look at the psi x t, that's a function. Whenever you see like f of x, it's a function of f of x. So these this it's a wave function with respect to position and time. And the wave function normalization accepts the fact that a probability must exist between 0 and 1 at any given point, such that the total probability of the system is one that the particle does exist somewhere. So if you look at that wave function in the prior screen, where you had like the single amplitude um, of the sine wave, this the single half of it, um, between the 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 inter intercept on the y-x axis, the first one and the second one, there's a probability of one that the particle is in that area. It has to exist somewhere in there. Now, at each point in there, it's a probability anywhere between 0 and 1. But the total summation, and you could use the normalization integral, which is basically just saying on an on a integral from infinite, negative infinity to infinity, with the probability density, right, the whole... Um, the whole wavelength of the, the the density of these particles has to be equal to one, and so you're just oh, yeah. normalizing it to one. That's where it basically means to normalize it to me. Is is and there's other normalizations out there too that Dr. Kroon could probably get into as far as um, limiting infinities, but uh, I think that's kind of way more complicated than we need to get into. But when you say that it, this is basically just a simple way of saying that we want everything to equal to one to normalize it. You guys have things to be that really exist careful. have a probability of existing of one. Yes, Dr. Kroon, what were you saying? Yeah, you guys have to be real careful if you're going down a sketchy part of the neighborhood at night. You go down a back alley and there's a guy in a trench coat that goes, Psst, "You want a, a probability density function? I got it real cheap." You're gonna get ripped off because he's gonna give you a non-normalized probability distribution function. You got it. It's useless. Unless it's normalized, so you got it. You got to be careful for people I'm trying to. So this, this is normal. why I'm trying to relate to people. You, you, these these things only really kind of are have use to us if we can normalize them. And so I wanted to, I wanted to think of a way. What's the easiest way to try to, to relate normalization? And the, the, I thought the normalization integral that I put here is probably the most simplistic way of doing it. And Landon, you're the math guy. Um, Make sense? Yes. I mean, I got this one uh, from somewhere, uh, obviously. I didn't make it up. Given the but, probabilities uh, of all over all space and time, you sum up all the probabilities for something that exists, you'll get one. Yeah. So I like, I saw this one. And I thought this universe was easy to describe it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unlike yeah. some that uh, positing supernatural probabilities out there, <clears throat> you know who you are, um, they don't exist. There's no such thing. Uh, yeah, you have to have, uh, it has to be one to zero. So anyway, that's your range. 
Yep. Okay, next. Now we get into some fun stuff. Like I said, there will be math involved. It's not, and it's not that complicated. This is like high school stuff. So the basically, mm -hmm. how does this all relate to this question? The distance formula in, in two-dimensional Euclidean space is basically derived from the Pythagorean theorem. We all learn this, a squared plus b equals b squared plus c squared. Now you can kind of manipulate that formula and you kind of get uh, d is equal to the square root of the, the square of the distance between two, two points on the x-axis plus the distance between two points on the y-axis, or the difference, I should say. So I could basically make a vector here. And a vector is basically a direction with a magnitude. So f how far you want to go and what direction. That's a magnet. That's a vector. SQR so means that's square the root in this case. Yeah, SQR is square root. Um, I didn't want to do a square root symbol, so I used the actual SQR. Um, but for 3D space, you can actually transform it a little bit, and you could do it with z-axis. So as you guys know, on a two-dimensional Cartesian plane, you have x and y, but in three-dimensional space, you've got x, y, and z. So this is the distance formula. So if I want to figure out what's the distance between uh, two positions of, in space, this is what I would use, non-Euclidean. I mean, Euclidean. So this is not for a non-Euclidean space because obviously, as, as Landon pointed out, with Euclidean space, you have curvature. And so you have to take that into account because you're not going to have uh, a straight line in free space. You're going to have a curve. All spaces, there's no such thing as two parallel lines in non-Euclidean space because they eventually curve at some point. Okay. Um, next, next slide. I don't think we need to kind of go into that at all. Unless you guys have anything to add to that? No. Very basic. This is where it gets interesting. And this is, I think, the, the one of the cruxes of why using the no boundary proposal um, uses very advanced techniques, but it's not really um, explaining what happens before the Big Bang or even maybe even what happens at t equals zero. How this works with the, the Hawking state is it uses what's called imaginary time. So normally for a four-dimensional manifold, um, you, you can add in time, so you have the d squared equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus t squared. Okay, so that's how you would relate in distance in space time. So d squared is some interval in space time, but that uses real time, and that's incompatible with general relativity at t equals zero, because we already established at t equals zero general relativity doesn't work. So what they try to do is they rewrite t squared using um, just a little bit of math, where i is equal to the square root of negative one. You guys remember? I'm talking about your audience, by the way, not not you three, <laughs> the audience. Uh, I, I, he's one of the best mathematicians in the world. He's explaining imaginary numbers to him. Okay, um, but basically, uh, to the audience, um, i is equal to the square root of negative one. It's a, it's it's a kind of a misnomer. It, people always tell me they really hate the fact they call it imaginary numbers because they 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 exist in the same way real numbers exist, um, but they're just on a different plane. And so, or a different field. Is it a different field or a different, um, it's a different field, they call it, right? I get field and ring mixed mixed up. Landon, I would, uh, the um, com complex field? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to call it the complex plane. That's simpler. So It's, it's um, okay to say complex plane. We, we, we do yeah, it. I'm going to say complex plane because that's the way I kind of I, I remember learning it mostly. Um, like if you have a Riemann sphere, that's going to be on the complex plane. And so you have a complex infinity at the North Pole of the Riemann sphere. So I kind of related it to a plane where I, these fields and rings and groups and all that ring theory stuff that gets way more complicated than I'll ever hope to understand. But what it does is it basically just takes the formula and puts it positive. So you have... Uh, t squared, which is a positive value, which doesn't break down to t zero equals zero, but you're using imaginary time to do this, right? So what does that mean to have imaginary time? Do we actually exist in imaginary time? Well, I, I don't know. That's where that's where I have to like say, well, is it really modeling reality if it's dealing with imaginary stuff? Um, somewhat. I mean, complex numbers do, m do model reality in, in sense of, of rotation, I guess, but I mean, how do you guys how do you guys look at this when you when you're dealing with imaginary times to relate to t equals zero? And I am going to ask Athena on this only for the fact like like she did a very specific video on no boundary condition. Um, how do you kind of like look at the way they that Hawking took the no boundary proposal and said, okay, I'm going to use imaginary time to kind of get to the uh, the, the base of the shuttlecock they call it the the the, the shape that the inflation period 
uh, made after it came out from that initial t equals zero? Yeah, so um, looking at it as imaginary time is trying to make a parallel mirror to what um, a time is here. So rather than being on a, a complex plane um, when it comes to uh, obviously I'm using imaginary numbers, trying to obviously like saying that there is actual existence, saying that there is um, as if everything is still constant as it is now, it would be just as constant as it is there. And that's the whole purpose is to try and create a parallel um, understanding of, of what we have now and then try to just repeat that but by using you know I guess imaginary time as, as you're saying because it's gonna be t, t equals trying to reach t equals zero um, where the, the the equation can actually withstand and, and um, general relativity will not uh, completely fold up, fall apart so uh, it, it is tr trying to make it in a sense where like th things are exactly as they, as they are now. Physics is still withstanding as it is now. Um, and just looking at it from uh, just a different, uh, using using imaginary numbers. So exactly what you said is it's it's not that uh, we're trying to say that like, no, we don't exist. None of this is actually in existence because the whole purpose is to try and um, find a way that it'll work in this realm. So in this this complex plane, and then, you know, try, try and make it as, as replicable to um, today, like uh, I guess, real standards, so real time standards, as opposed to imaginary time. So all, all the variables are supposed to be directly relevant to uh, our universe as it, as it is today. So that's from from my understanding of uh, the no boundary proposal and what Hawking was working on. Um, that is the, this is the sole purpose. So um, as far as you asking about whether whether or not uh, this was supposed to be, you know, the same conditions in which we are in today. It is supposed to be with, withstanding um, in both uh, in both realms, if we can say. I guess uh, that might be a, a a relatively okay term to use right now because it's all the same variables. Um, you're just using imaginary time. So yeah. There you go. Um, okay, that that exactly way I look at it. Doctor Kearney, want to like touch on that? Uh, well, the only thing I'd say is, um, well, so, so Steve, this is getting into a topic that you like a lot, which is like philosophy and you know, epistemology and stuff like, is it real or not? Well, of course, it's non-real in the sense that tech, the, the, the term we use is imaginary, but is it reflected in reality in like in the in a real quote, quote, sense? I don't know. I, I like I said before, I'm a scientific. It kind of dives, dives into more philosophy at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're definitely uh, useful for solving differential equations and they show up a lot in and and you know solving circuit problems and quantum mechanics is all over the place um so, so i don't know they're definitely useful and so i guess uh, by my existence and my usage of them they have a little bit of realness to them in that sense in that instrumentalist sense in the instrumentalist sense uh, sir landon yeah i mean don't but don't don't confuse the model with reality um, right. Mm -hmm. We. Mm -hmm. This is a good model for describing reality. Whether reality works this way or not, is is perhaps irrelevant to the value of the model, which is helping you describe what you are observing. Reality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So, what does this all mean? Um, so in order to even try to express what happens at t equals zero, or even understand any of this, you got to know a hell of a lot of shit. Uh, let's be honest. This is not easy stuff. <laughs> to, even, to even approach the question, <laughs> what happens before the Big Bang? Yeah, it's nothing that you're, you're going to dive right into without having some kind of basic understanding of a lot of different com complex comp uh, topics. Um, it's, it's, it's combining mathematics, it's combining cosmogony, it's combining physics, it's combining mathematics. A whole bunch of different subjects are required to even start to approach something of this magnitude. Um, it requires very complex normalization techniques, and they are very complicated. Uh, Dr. Kroon can attest to that, I'm sure. Um, the use of imaginary time, and to even attempt to describe what happens at t equals zero. Um, so my overall point of this is to kind of give everybody, whoever wants to look into this, these are the things that you kind of need to look into if you're going to really understand Hawking's, uh, Hawkins, uh, Hawking's um, no boundary proposal and what it means to even ask the question, what happened before the Big Bang? Because there is literally no real time at t equals zero 
So there cannot be anything before t equals zero. So to ask the question to me, it's still nonsensical because you're dealing with now imaginary time to even get it at t zero. Now, Landon had brought up things like the bounce, big bounce, and um, the multiverse, which kind of gets into things like uh, meta time and other things, but they're not what we're talking about as far as time in our universe. So I'm going to maintain that while it's productive to ask the question, what happened before the Big Bang? It's still a nonsensical question. Again, mm -hmm. if I asked you, point to me on the real number line where the imaginary a number is, one, where I exist, it's nonsensical. But it, is it a productive question, maybe from a pedagogical approach, by saying, hey, look, it's not on that line. I'm showing you that's not on there. So is there educational value out of it? Sure. But it doesn't make sense to really attempt to legitimately ask that question when it's a nonsensical question. That's my summation. I think that's, is that my last slide? Dave? Uh, okay, one, uh, one last one. Um, and then you guys can do your summations. Um, it doesn't get you to, to before the Big Bang. Uh, it cannot be used to describe conditions at t less than zero because there is no space, there's no time, imaginary and otherwise to, to measure. There's this, I'm going to say nothing now. I really, it gets into philosophy whether there's nothing before the, uh, the Big Bang because, again, there's just a nonsensical statement there. Um, so I, I don't only want to say there's nothing before the Big Bang. I think the whole statement is nonsensical. Um, but Stephen Hawking's attempt to describe t equals zero, what we know now as the no boundary proposal, simply does not get you to anything, quote, unquote, before the Big Bang. And also, I, I did want to note this. It assumes Lorentzian over Minkowski space, which I think is a big thing. Now, that's just my, my view from reading into this. I, I'm really just pulling that out of my particular interpretation of this, that we don't use a Lorentzian or neo-Lorentzian model. You do use a Minkowski space model. So it takes a very different approach to how we look at space-time and how we look at spatial dimensions with relationship to emergent temporal dimensions. But I think, now this one's the last slide, right? Dave, is that the last one? No. And then you guys are going to wrap up. How many more I got? <laughs> oh, OK. okay. I remember now. I was like, wait a minute. And, this one and two more, Steve. Uh, and these are quotes. Okay, so let's just rush through this because we're running out of time, and then you guys give your summations. Um, in Stephen Hawking's own words, events before the Big Bang are simply not defined because there's no way one can measure what happened at them. Since events before the Big Bang have no observational consequences, one may as well cut them out of the theory and say that time began at the Big Bang rather than anything before the Big Bang. So that's in his own words. Next one. Um, he also wrote in A Brief History of Time, as we can see, the concept of time has no meaning before the beginning of the universe. And uh, one could still imagine that God created the universe at the instant of the Big Bang, or even afterwards in such a way as to make it look as though there had been a Big Bang. But it would mean meaningless to suppose that it had been created before the Big Bang. And I think Landon kind of touched on this, and it does get into more theology and philosophy. If some entity exists out space time, how did he create something in time. It, it makes no sense um, to say that, that there was a time before the universe such that something existed and that created all this. Um, it's a very difficult... I, I don't think it makes much sense for, for a non-temporal entity to make something that's temporal. But that's my person position on it. Um, and we, we can get into um, quantum foam. We can get into how the bubble expanded and you kind of did a little bit earlier, but that's not a being doing that. It's not a non-temporal being doing that. So uh, next. And the end. So the question of what happened for the Big Bang is nonsensical. That's my summation. So we're, mm -hmm. let's kind of get your guys' view on this. Um, let's wrap it up. We, I don't want to keep it too much longer. Um, Athena, I'm going to save you for last, if I may, because you're, you're new and I'm going to give you the, like, the, the longest thing that you need to do to wrap up and make sure that people do subscribe to you. So I'm going to actually start with my co-host first, Landon. Um, what do you got to say about the presentation? Well, thank, did I change your mind at you all? Again, or did I, 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 I thought it was a very good uh, presentation. Um, thank you. And it means a lot allowed us to bring up a lot of topics. You can find that these topics are all very tightly interconnected, right? It, and, and, and it's difficult to talk about one thing without bringing in a whole a number of other items. I would, I would encourage people to, again, consider that um, models, don't confuse models with reality. Models are what we use to try to describe reality. And um, the mathematics behind those models helps us 
you know, give very precise language as to what the model is. In regards to the question about, well, you know, uh, what happened before the Big Bang, there are valid Big Bang models that say, uh, that, that, that state that time was created at the moment of Big Bang, that is, that is, that is t equals zero was where um, time was created. If you talk about time being as far as causality, uh, as, as Hawking eloquently stated, um, if, if there are things that happen before t equals zero, they have no uh, effect on what happens at t equals zero or beyond. And so, or just say, uh, certainly beyond T0, they may have an effect on, at, at T0. Um, if, if that is one, well, the case- what is, what, can, I, can I interject real quick? One, one possible sure. exception. Um, if there was no actual T equals zero such that there was anything before, there, like the, there's, there's a paper that I was sent, and I think, I, I don't know who sent it to me, it was, maybe Dr. Kroon sent it to me, but I was reading a paper on the big bounce where there is a small window where any prior existing universe of some kind um, could have had a minor influence on the initial conditions for our universe as of today. So it was a, a well, that's, only that's existing why I balance. admitted my. But that's did why you, I did you send that to me or did he? I don't remember. Who sent that to me? I don't think I don't think I sent it. Hmm, I don't know. I've, I've I've been talking to a lot of people on this particular topic. So, but on the big bounce, there's some. It, it, like you said, it doesn't get to t equals zero because there's no mathematical singularity in that particular model. Right. Yes. Like in this and model, so, there's no singularity. And so you can either say that you use a model that says that time was created at, at t equals zero um, in the Big Bang, or that things that are t less than zero before the Big Bang have no impact on things after the Big Bang, no consequences, and therefore, um, as 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 Hawking said, you might as well um, not you know cut them out of the theory. Okay. No Dr. So, um, is it, is it, I, I, it's second. a valid thing to wonder, but it, 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 but, but not all questions have answers. And this may be one of those questions that is, is actually not valid. Um, and the universe doesn't have an answer for. Yeah, no, I, and I agree with that. That's why I, I, it wouldn't be before the big bang. That's, that's, that's why, I mean, no matter what, theory of time you subscribe to a or b it doesn't have any effect here you don't you don't if there's a multiverse or something like that it's not before the big bang it's not it's not with respect to us so you can't say before um it gets into a lot more complexity that i would willing to get into at this particular junction but um yeah it's not before the big bang but dr Kroon, what, what so, so when someone asks around, what happened never... <laughs> before the big bang the answer is is is, is not even nothing um, there was no before. Right. That, well, that's, and that's what I said before. I, I don't even like these phrase, there was nothing before the Big Bang, because, again, it's just a nonsensical question to me. But let's kind of wrap it up here. Dr. Kroon? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. I agree with everything Landon said, and that's a good position to take, if I understand correctly. <laughs> but look yeah, you always want to agree with Landon for the most part. Unless it's philosophy, <laughs> then you feel free to go after him. Yeah, we have, uh, we have learned a lot, and the royal we... Um, and we provided a um, rather broad and comprehensive um, presentation of the background that one would need to investigate further, to even begin to understand things as complex, and no pun intended, as the singularity um, or the exact moment that the Big Bang um, started when it was um, at, like, at t equals zero. And so we've, we've opened up a, a broad spectrum of uh, of concepts that we could uh, conceivably uh, use in the in current and future research to inform our our studies of uh, of the universe at large and uh, its its origins. And so, uh, in that sense, I'm a I guess an instrumentalist and a pragmatist and uh, just an all around science guy guy. And so, yeah, the 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 bottom line is we got to tell Kyle that the answer is. Uh, no, it's nonsensical, and um, just like saying what's colder than absolute zero or what's uh, north of the North Pole or south of the South Pole, um, but you could have a lot of fun talking about it. 
And that's that's. Uh, I, I think that's a about. good way of wrapping it up. And and maybe one of these days we'll get into the the whole what happens at absolute zero. And even you can you can kind of go lower than absolute zero, but it's actually warmer in absolute zero. It's it's weird how what happens right at absolute zero. The, the, some of the effects. Yeah, because it's trying to it's trying to uh, yeah, pull it have back. negative flow, right? So it's so mm -hmm. absolute zero is absolute zero, but there is small things that you can actually mess with to get it to go less than absolute zero, but it's actually a warmer system. Um, and heat always goes from warmer to colder. So, but that's a whole different ball game too. But anyways, Athena, uh, first of all, I do really want to yeah. thank you for, for coming on here. I know that, um, you know, uh, I don't know how often you do things like this. I've never seen you do any kind of on air or interview or anything like that. So I'm very appreciative of that. I just happen to like your videos, especially that one, because it was so on point with what we we're talking today. And I do hope that we can kind of coax you to come back. Um, we have non sequitur show. We have my own channel that we have to do things on and we talk about science a lot. So, um, I can add you to our list when we have hangouts, you'll know about it and you have free reign to come in and drop in on any of them. But uh, what do you think so far and what's your summation? And please tell them again how to find your stuff because I'm getting people your links, but they got to go subscribe <laughs> to you guys. What's wrong with you? She's a supermodel <laughs> and she's brilliant. What the hell is wrong with you? I mean, come on. Uh, Just, well, you're the up? best. This was so much fun. Um, I definitely would, would love to come back and, and talk about some more stuff uh, like the double slit experiment. So, well, my overall gist from everything we spoke about today is the fact that we haven't collected any data from before the Big Bang happened would answer, my, my answer would be, yeah, it's, 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 um, uh, it's a nonsensical question to, to ask if there was anything before the Big Bang because there's no observational data. But part of me starts to think about things that we don't understand, which is if there's alternate dimensions happening that we can't access or something like certain animals that can't see color, but we know color exists. So moments like that make me think, hmm, maybe asking if there was anything before the Big Bang isn't really nonsense, you know? So, so that's kind of where I'm at right now, but I, I think it's good to keep exploring this. I mean, it's, it's kind of sil silly to say, but I'd love to obviously uh, pick everyone's brains about that another time. Um, but but I, as far as what we do understand with math and the fact that there is no um, measurement of time or anything existing, um, uh, any, any type of thing existing before t equals zero, then it would answer, you know, the answer would be that, yeah, I mean, it's it's a kind of a nonsense question, nonsensical question to ask. So that that's so, my overall uh, summation. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question since you, you, you're involved in education, science education. Um, yes. What do you do when a, when, when a kid comes up and says, you know, doctor, what happened before the Big Bang? How do you respond to that child's question? So I usually will say to them that right now we don't actually know. I usually will say we don't actually know, but um, we do know that there is a, an entire process to happen just after the Big Bang. So I encourage you to go into this field, to try and figure it out, to be part of all the teams, to research what, what Stephen Hawking was researching before he passed away, and um, try and come up with your own theory. That's usually what, what I'll do. Excellent answer. It is an excellent Thanks. answer. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with one last question, and this is going to be a real quick one, and then Dave's going to take us out. Um, and by the way, stick around for a few minutes just afterwards if you can. Um, but uh, so here's my question to you all. And what do you think? So Landon, Landon, do colors exist? And the, the correct answer is no. I'm going to tell you right here now. I'm just going to be, you know, poison the well. But do colors exist or is color realism a thing? The color realism. I, I say perceptions of colors exist. The, why do you got to change the question, Landon? Do colors exist <laughs> other than phenomenally in the brain? Do they exist in, ontologically in the universe? I can play this game too, trust me. <laughs> Why does he got to think I, about this question? Or I could just stop the whole thing now, Steve. Yeah, uh, I'm not, yeah come on. I, uh, I, I, I mean, okay, so, 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 so Steve, you're, you're claiming that colors don't exist. We're gonna have we're gonna have a chat, Landon. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna. Uh, you know what? You know me. I don't care if people have PhDs. If if I have a good argument, I'm gonna lay it out there. So we're gonna get back to you on that. So uh, so Dr. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about I, now he the wants to answer. Why I'm thinking about your question. The reason why I'm thinking about your question is that if you don't understand how complex the question is that you're asking, you don't understand the question. Well, that's why, that's why, but that's why it is a complex question. It very much so is, but that's why I've, I'm actually narrowing it down. And I'll even 
we'll phrase it this way. Do colors exist other than just existing in your mind as a phenomenon that exists because of your brain's interpretation of the light being um, reflected or emitted from an object? Is, or is there an intrinsic property of, of colors that exist independent of our observations? I would speculate that they, they do not no. exist independent of our, of our observation. Good answer. Good answer. What about you, um, Dr. Kroon? So I always I always like to define the terms of the question before answering it, so I know what I'm answering. Got too many smart people in here. <laughs> <laughs> and so I could I could say if you interpret color as um, um, an intrinsic property of the photon yeah, that's quantified via its wavelength, then we don't need to perceive it for it to exist. But then playing devil's advocate, you could turn right around and say, "Well, that's just that's wavelength. That's not color." And now now we're into yeah, semantics. Yeah, the color now itself is in the brain. So that's, that, not, that's not well, actually that, semantics. That's actually phenomenology. But, okay. Semantics yeah, but it undermines important. it undermines the possibility of perception. And so I would say yes, the colors exist. We're gonna have a talk. We're gonna have a talk. Yeah. Uh, Athena, how about you? Are you gonna slide with them? Or are you gonna go with me on this one? <laughs> yes, colors exist. By the way, that's hey. all I'm gonna say. Oh. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm gonna, you know what? I'm I, I, change? I don't mind. Okay. I don't hey. mind. I'll do it. You know I will. <laughs> uh, see, so. Steve, actually, I got Dave on my side. Dave, please tell me early. Hey, God, are you on my side? Dave, well, because Dave, Steve, Steve, you can't. Steve, Steve. He's the ignoring me. Why is God color, not listening to me? The only color I know for sure exists is purple. Just saying. Purple is one color that definitely doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> Even color realists say so, purple. So I, 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 I think hearing <laughs> you, you ask pink. the question, yeah. people discuss pink, it. I don't remember. Um, uh, I, see, next time, I guys. The answer to your everything. question that I think you're asking is no. It does not exist outside of the right. mind. Right. That's, right, the, right. that's the question I'm asking. Yes. Right. right so that's like how I'm interpreting as well, but it bothers me. <laughs> we'll have to well, make here's a debate another about question, this Steve. Does the fact that we perceive it make it real? Exactly. Uh, no. That's what I would have brought up. No, because because we perceive dreams, but dreams are not real either. Dreams happen. Well, the I colors. Happen. The color. Well, the, we, if you want to, if, see, here's the way I look at it. If you want to say that the color is because we the brain's interpretation of the photons, energy positive energy on the retina okay but the problem with that is it doesn't hold because in a dream there's nothing hitting your retina and we still see colors it's a phenomenon that exists solely in the brain because the brain is interpreting electrical signals and the way the brain does that is by producing a color that we have a phenomenon that exists a phenomenology wait then where's the malfunction for those that are colorblind is that in the brain or is it in the eye i don't, I don't well, actually that, know this because then that, that would bring that, up an argument they don't, well the colorblind people Obviously, they don't have the cone to, to see certain colors, right? Or there's some kind of right. physical damage, right? Um, I don't know if they dream in color. I, you know what? I, I have no idea. That's a good question. I know my neighbor. My neighbor this. is colorblind. And he's been a mm -hmm. friend of mine for like two years. And uh, he says that he doesn't notice anything different between. because So that, well, that, that would favor I would think the that you still... um, neurological standpoint. Right. I would look at it this way, and we could check this out, and we're going to be ending this in like 30 seconds, but I would look at it this way. If a person has been exposed to colors before, then their brain can interpret certain colors, and they know that they're supposed to look like. Because the brain is really good at filling in the blanks. So even though you mm -hmm. can't visually see colors anymore, if you lost color, if you lost your sightness, then you wouldn't see a particular color. But if you're colorblind from birth, then I don't think that it's possible that you could see like the color green, because you know no reference to what green actually looks like. Do you? Mm -hmm. So Seems like I, was in, to me. I was I was in a uh, medically induced uh, state of keeping me out of my mind because I was uh, had an extremely high fever as a child, and in that medical state, um, I perceived and experienced a color that I knew didn't exist on the color wheel. I can still remember that color. That's pretty cool. But it actually. doesn't exist. Well, right? it, well, it, again, it exists in my mind. Yeah. Purple, but I think it it's purple exist. or pink doesn't exist either. It's pink. I, I can't pink show you this color because it's not, yeah. there's no physical manifestation, but it happens to be a, a, a drug-induced uh, symptom in my brain. Well, and there's also people that are tetrachromatic, what are they, tetrachromatic? Um, tetrachromograph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tetra they basically can see multiple colors that we can't see. But anyways, fascinating topic. Um, we got so much more that we, we can discuss, but 
we'll leave this for other episodes. We are going to be trying to do this every other week. And I'm, I, if I could get to every week, and I will, but I got to tell you, there's so many things going on. Um, I am having a discussion coming up. Uh, I believe it's on the 8th of October with John Perry from Stated Clearly. I'm going to be talking about his DNA a code. Um, I'm arguing that it's not a code. It's more like a cipher. And I'm going to be arguing from different reasonings for that. I've talked to Dr. Mays. I've talked to Dr. Stern from Don Hopkins University. He's a geneticist. And I've also talked to another friend of mine who I just know by epigenetics on Twitter that you guys may know. He's a geneticist, PhD. All three of them are in accordance with me. So I'm going to be using my particular arguments with, with, with addition to what they've told me and what I've read. And I'm going to be trying to explain it to you. It's John, who I have the utmost respect for. I love his videos, stated clearly. I just think that it's a little bit of misnomer to call it a code, um, unless you're talking about specifically the lettering, in which case you're just substituting secondary symbols for primary symbols. But we'll get into all that. But if you guys got suggestions, please leave it for me in the comment section. Uh, message me. Let me know what you think of these, these videos. Thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever. Um, but definitely go subscribe to Athena. I put the link in the video description, and I've put it in the live chat like four dozen times. So I've already seen her numbers go up, <laughs> but I want to see over the next couple of days. Let's get her at least 200 subs out of this because she took her time out to do this, and I know she's got things to do here in about 15 minutes or so. So we got to wrap it up. So I want to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for double streaming to my channel and the Non Sequitur Show, the first time we've done that, and I thought it was fun. So thank you all. Dave, you can take us out. Non sequitur, your facts are uncoordinated.